Welcome to Christ Church Online. We're so happy that you could join us. If you're ever in the northern New Jersey area, we would love to have you worship with us live at either of our two locations. Whether you choose to attend our classic cathedral in the heart of Montclair or our beautiful campus in Rockaway Township, we promise to make you feel right at home. We broadcast every Sunday, so make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on social media at Christ Church USA. You can also check us out on our website at ChristChurchUSA.org for more information on our mission of connecting people to God and people to people. Now it's time for worship. Welcome to Christ Church. Would you stand with us as we begin our time of worship? There's someone next to you that's waiting for your greeting. Would you greet them and welcome them this morning? Welcome. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the Praise the hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm. My weapon is a melody 
sing a little louder. watching Christ Church Online, and we're excited to have you here. We'll get back to our Sunday service in just a bit. But first, we want you to know that it's your generosity that allows us to serve people in the northern New Jersey area and the world with Love Field Ministry, such as this online service. With that being said, would you consider partnering with us in ministry through your giving? If you're moved to leave an offering, simply text the word GIVE plus the amount to the number below or by hitting the Give tab at the top corner of our website. Form a partnership with God today in giving through the local church to help see the hope of the world, Jesus Christ, spread throughout the whole globe. And now, back to our message. So this morning, I want to talk about the transformed life, the transformed life. God wants to, He wants to transform us. There are a lot of things that the transform life has to do with, we use the word salvation or sometimes we use the word saved, you know. And sometimes what happens is when, we're, when we are throwing around terms, they kind of get lost in the shuffle. But we've been singing about salvation all day today, how God broke into our brokenness, how he broke into our lives and delivered us. And he delivered us from sin. The Bible teaches all of us are sinners, every one of us. We're sinners because our forefather, Adam and Eve, our forefathers, Adam and Eve, sinned against God. And it changed their relationship. And from that moment, God had already set in motion a plan whereby you and I can have a deep relationship with God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, the Bible says this, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do no longer. Therefore, if any man, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. I like what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, we don't regard Christ, we don't regard him after a worldly point of view. You know, when Jesus was on earth, they looked at him a different. They looked at him as, some, some looked at him as a, a devout Jewish teacher. Others thought he was crazy. In fact, in a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, he said, who do people say that I am? And they said, some John the Baptist and others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In the same way, they minimized Jesus in that day as being a good person. Same thing happens today. You know, people have all kinds of ideas about who Jesus is. And some think he's a great teacher or just a myth. But this is when you regard Jesus after a worldly view or, or after the flesh as some of the other versions have it. This doesn't speak to the fullness of who he is because the Bible says that Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. He came with a mission to pay the price, to bring us back. There's a gulf, a separation between God and man. And so he came with a mission to pay the price that that gulf can be dealt with. And so I want to say this morning that he's not a philosophy to be studied, but he's a God to be experienced. There's a difference between going to a social club 
the Rotary Club, you know, the American Legion and hearing great speeches about great people. But there's something about Jesus. Jesus is not just good ideas, right? He is God come in the flesh. And not only that, but he wants you to have an experience with him. And therefore, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, love that terminology because to be in Christ means that you are united to him. It means that you are partaker of his life. You know, think about a, a branch that they want to, that has fruit, but they want to graft that branch into another tree so that that fruit can can continue to grow and they they take this branch that it, that was from a different tree and they graft it in to a tree and all of a sudden life begins to flow into that branch again and I want you to know that's the same idea here that we've been grafted into Christ we've been connected to him we've been united to him and as a result of that we have become a partaker of his life and to be saved is to understand God's will for salvation and God's will for salvation is that all men should be saved. It also means to understand God's way of salvation. And God's way of salvation is that Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood that you and I might have access to God. Jesus said, repent and believe. I love the, repentance is an action word. It's not just saying stuff. But it's an action word. The, re the word repentance literally means to change your mind, to turn around. You're going in one direction, and now you turn around and you decide to go in another direction. That's really what repentance is all about. And some of us have experienced that. We were going in, in a way far from God, but God spoke to us. He dealt with us, and we turned around, became believers in him. And when you repent, when you give your life to Christ, there needs to be evidence of a transformed heart and a transformed life. Because believing and repentance go together. Would you say that with me? Believing and repentance and repentance go together. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The new creation has come. In other words, transformation is evident. Because something new has happened. Paul states that he uses that word creation. We become a new creation. And he links it to the book of Genesis. Where the earth was formless and void. And the Bible says darkness was upon the face of the deep. But then God moved upon the darkness. He moved upon the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. I love that verse because if you look at it, God doesn't create the sun for, for a couple of verses down the road. So that light was his light. Let there be light. He let my light shine on the darkness. And listen, Paul is connecting that thought. A lot of us were, our lives were destroyed. Our lives were empty. Our lives were full of darkness. But at one time, Jesus came in into your life and into my life and said, let there be light. And all of a sudden, the light of God comes into us. And what we didn't know before, now we know. What we didn't believe before, now we believe. What we, what we rebelled against at one time, now we're, we're following that. Transformation is evident because the God that made the world by his word will remake you by his word. Give you new desires. This is how you know you're a, you're, you're a believer. How you know you've received transformation. Because you want to follow God's commands. I remember before I came to the Lord, I didn't want to follow God's command. In fact, the pastor of the church back then actually literally came to my house back then. Visited my mom and my, my sisters who were going. And, and he, he knew that I wasn't going to church, so he was specifically targeting me. Came to my house, knocked on my door, and started sharing with me and you know you know why he asked me a question I'll never forget this he said well, Robert why don't you come to church and of course I here's a 13 year old kid making excuses you know oh I'm sick all the time and you know I my hair doesn't brush right and you know I, I don't know I don't remember all that I said so foolish mis, foolish answers to him but those same foolish answers when God touched my life they turned to say 
I want to be a part of what God's doing. I want to be a part of God's house. I want to be a part of the, of the kingdom of God. This word new, I love this word new in the Greek. When, when Paul says you become a new creation, he says the new creation has come. This is such a powerful word in the Greek. The word in the Greek for new is the word kainos, kainos. And it's rich in meaning. And this is what this word means. Listen to this definition of kainos. In other words, the word new. When the word says new in the Bible, this is what it means. It means unused. You ever felt used? But when you become a creation, a new creation, God removes that sense of someone who's been used. He makes you unused, unworn. Here's a great one. I love this. This is what this word new means in that verse. It means unprecedented. That when you come to the Lord and you become a new creature, new creation in Christ, you are unprecedented. There's nothing like you. You're extraordinary. These are all the same words, new in the New Testament. It means extraordinary. You're unique. When you get up in the morning... And you're doing your hair or you're combing your, your, your whatever you do in the morning. <laughs> I want you to look at yourself and say, you're unique. You see, because God don't make no junk. Sorry for the bad English. The word new means exceptional. And the reason why I'm giving you these words is because some of us forget who we are. We allow the, the cares of life and the, and, the, and the trials that we go through and the, and the difficulties sometimes that we're involved in, we allow that to cloud our perspective of who we are. And we start thinking other things other than the way God sees us. But God sees you as exceptional. God sees you as uncommon, unusual. Well, that's, that's an easy one for some of us, unusual, right? He sees you as special. And here's the word I really love. When I saw this in the Greek, I couldn't believe it was there. The word new. You know what that word new means? Unheard of. Unheard of. There's never been anything like you. Never before. And guess what? Never after will there be anything like you. You're unique. You're special in God's plan and purpose. Why do you think the enemy of your soul desires so much to destroy you and to, and to get you off track and to get you to dis get be become discouraged and offline? He understands that there's never been anything like you. You're unheard of. I have a friend, his name is Bobby Rodriguez. And he's a preacher also. And literally, uh, and, and literally he looks exactly like me. We have, there's no relation. Maybe because we're Puerto Rican. I don't know what it is. You know, all Puerto Ricans look alike, right? So, but I'm literally, he has the same features, the same nose, everything exactly like me. And people used to think we were brothers. And so we used to just say, yeah, we are brothers. And of course, we're brothers in Christ. But you know, no matter how much we look like each other, if you're a twin, no matter how much you look like you're unique. There's something special about you. There's something that nobody else has that God put in you for his purpose. You are unheard of. And guess what? When you go, there'll be nothing else like you ever again. You're important to God's purpose and plan. So if you're here and you're discouraged and things have not worked out, think about that for a moment. That, that God has crafted you and made you. The Bible says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. I heard the story of a, of a businessman who was selling a property and this, this man came to, to purchase the property and the businessman felt bad because the, the property was in pretty much disarray. People had broken into the place, windows were broken, pipes were gone. And so he felt bad. He said, look, I'll, 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 let me bring up the, uh, the property up to a little bit better standard. And the businessman, the buyer said, don't worry about bringing anything up. He said, forget about the repairs. When I, buy, <clears throat> when I buy this place, I'm going to build something completely different. I don't want the building. I want the site. 
And listen, when you come, God's not interested in you making repairs on your life before you come. Some of us are like, oh God, I'll come, but let me get my act together. Let me do this and let me do that. I, I know I shouldn't. And I, I don't know how many of my friends said, if, Robert, if I ever come to church, the, the ceiling is going to collapse. Some of you may have heard that somewhere along the line. We're trying this, this angle of getting ourselves together with God so, so we can become acceptable. But God says, no, I don't want you to do anything. I'm going to do all the work in your life. I'm going to repair you. I'm going to make you something brand new. I'm going to make you something unheard of, something that you've never been before. I'm going to make you. He told the disciples, follow me and I will make you. So many people are trying to make themselves. But what God wants to do, he wants to do something totally different. He wants to revolutionize your life. He wants to transform your life into something that you've never been before. I love the analogy of the, uh, you know, the, the caterpillar and the butterfly. You know, that caterpillar, it's about yay long, I don't know, some longer than that. And some people would say that's a very unattractive bug. You know, it's got all these, uh, I don't know how many legs that it's crawling and it's crawling and you know, you look at it, oh, ah, bleh, you know. But that caterpillar, takes itself and it connects himself to a tree or herself, whoever it happens to be. And he starts to spin a cocoon around himself. And before you know it, this cocoon is engulfed, has engulfed this caterpillar. And all of a sudden, weeks later, something starts to break out of that cocoon. But it's not the caterpillar or not what it used to be. The caterpillar has been, the word is metamorphosized. It means changed into something else. And when that bug breaks free, here comes this beautiful butterfly that at one time people looked at it and disdained that, that bug. But now all of a sudden everybody admires the beauty of that butterfly. Let me tell you something. That's us. Yeah, we were once a caterpillar. But God got a hold of us and put us in a cocoon. We busted out of that cocoon something other than what we were before. You know what I'm talking about. I love the fact the Bible says that Jesus will take you as you are. Jesus knows the damage that life has caused you. But he's the master builder. And he'll take your life because guess what? He's got the skills to do it. You know, when you got skills... How many got skills here? Don't raise your hand. Let me remember. How many got When you got skills, you can do things that no one else can do. I, I bought a, a bedroom set. And when I got it home, of course, I broke something. <laughs> I broke the, uh, the post that connected to the headboard. And I'm looking at this and say, okay, what am I going to do with this now, you know? And I remembered I had a friend who this is what he does for a living. And I said to him, Jeff, could you fix this? Is there anything you can do with this thing? You know what? When I got it home, it took him two days to do it. When I got it home, not only did it look like it never broke, it looked better than when I first got it. I don't know how that happened. But he, with his master craftsman skill, he attached the broken pieces. He made it stronger than it was before. He added some lacquer to make it look shiny and brand new. That's what God does with our lives. He makes you stronger than you were before. He takes the brokenness of your life and the things that you said, you know, nothing will ever come of me. But he'll take that very thing that's broken and turn it around to bless you. The old is gone. I love the fact that God never wastes a hurt. When we've been hurt and, and demolished and disoriented, God wants to take that and turn it around, guess what, to bless you. Because he'll never waste a hurt. Only God can do that. Heard the story. It's a great story of the Red Cross. And they were helping folks in Biafra. Some of you probably remember this story. But they were down there in Biafra trying to help some of the African people there. And they got a box uh, with a note. And in this note, the note said, we've become believers in Christ. And because of our conversion, we want to try to help the people in Biafra. 
We won't ever need these things again. Can you use them for something? And when they opened the box, inside the box were several Ku Klux Klan sheets. And the Red Cross took them and cut them into strips and used them as bandages to bandage the wounds of the people in Biafra. God can take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it around for good. The very same thing that was meant for your destruction, God will turn it around and cause it to bless you. That's the God we serve. The Bible says that he gives beauty for ashes. He gives joy for the spirit of heaviness. The very same things that seem impossible to get over. Jesus transforms that piece of your life into something beautiful. Today, we're celebrating the transformation of lives here today. That's what we're doing. We're celebrating the fact that as many of us, these individuals who come to the waters of baptism, they've been transformed. They've given their life to Jesus. Their lives have been changed. And today, they want to publicly declare that I'm on my way. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And so we want to celebrate with them. We want to celebrate with them this issue of water baptism. Let me just say, water baptism is, symbolizes the believer's total trust and total reliance on the Lord. Water baptism, we are baptized because the Lord commanded us. I don't know how many times I hear people say, well, I don't, I, you know, I got saved, but I don't really need to be baptized in water. No, no. We need to obey the Lord, right? The Lord says, he that believes and is baptized, right? So he wants us to be baptized. So these folks <clears throat> are not only coming because their lives have been changed, but they're coming in obedience to the Lord's command. And water baptism finally is a picture of what the Lord has done for us. That he was buried, right? He died. He was buried, but he rose again. And when these folks go into the water, they are being buried. It's a funeral service, right? They're being buried. But they're rising again in newness of life, never to return, never to go back to that place again. And yes, they'll have struggles. We all do. There's going to be that residual effect of our previous life. But guess what? God has not only saved us, but we are being saved, right? We are being saved. And finally, we shall be saved. Thank you for joining us at Christchurch Online. That concludes this week's broadcast. Make a connection with us by subscribing to us on YouTube and social media at Christchurch USA. Or check us out on our website at ChristchurchUSA.org. Be sure to join us next week and we'll see you soon. Bye!